a transformation. How can we take what we do and connect the dots with technology to create transformation every day? Now, I've always been engaged with technology, and I've always wanted to use technology to achieve an outcome. So one day, I decided that I wanted to change my life. And I picked up my smartphone. I made a profile on Tinder. Somebody swiped right, and then I got married. That's me. I got married from somebody that I met on Tinder. But my journey of technology did not stop there. We both realized that there was something that was missing in our lives. So we went on a different journey, a journey this time of using artificial intelligence. And we went through three rounds of fertility treatment to get my beautiful baby girl called Dixie. She's five years old. These are our favorite chickens, Mavis and Hey Hey. We've got about 13 chickens at home. And in that day, as you can well imagine, I had a big smile on my face because over 22 years ago now, one doctor told me I could never have children. And so I knew when I met this person using Tinder um, that we were going to go on a journey together. And now, in this moment, we became a mum and a dad. But Dixie had different ideas, the strong, curious character that she is. And completely naturally, along came Blossom. So this Blossom's now three years old. And the way that I look at this, it was buy one, get one free. And I lived in London for 25 years. I moved out of London, and uh, now I'm also a beekeeper. So I keep about 100,000 bees um, who have had a really challenging time, actually, over the last two or three years with everything that's going on. Uh, so I just want to share a little bit of information with you. A statistic. 70% of all new initiatives fail. They fail to achieve their original outcome. So why is it that we spend all of this time not getting to where we need to get to? So I'm going to come back to that conversation that we had earlier around thinking about being curious, having courage, having empathy. And during that empathy process, there's an understanding of what we do know and what we don't know. And has anybody here seen the iceberg of ignorance? Just put your hand in the air if you've seen this before. OK, there's a couple of you in the room. Um, interesting statistics here. Now, when I share this with you, it's not about, um, you know, oh, no, I don't know anything that's going on in my organization, because that's not true. You do know what's going on. But actually, when was the last time you took a step back, looked at all of the moving parts, and as I mentioned, we call this system thinking, every single moving part in your organization connecting together, that's when the magic can happen. So, staff frontline people, people on the phones having conversations, they see 100% of the problems. Does anybody know what team leaders see? What percentage? 100% of people on the front line see what's going on? 74%. 74% of those problems now get a conversation around them. What are we going to do with it? Managers get to see only 9% whereas senior executives only see 4% of those conversations. So when you think about that flow of conversations, whether it be face-to-face, -face, whether it be using technology, we know that there are challenges out there. And there is actually a global challenge going on. This isn't just about your industry or you know, the work that I do with PwC. I work with multiple industries with the work that I do. And there is a global change coming. And the way that we manage that global change can be, quite very simply, asking the right questions. And so I'm just curious, did anybody here you know, do any research on me before today? Anybody here do any research on me before today? OK, so I'm going to bring something up in a minute that you might or might not know about me. Now, I had the pleasure of opening up the AI conference a couple of years ago. And uh, I got to meet Sophia. Does everybody know Sophia the Android? You all heard the conversations around where a Tesla are going with their Tesla bot. $20,000, you can have this person in your home doing all the mundane tasks. So this is a reality of where we're at right now with this change that's going on. So I asked Sophia a question. Now, before I share with you what that question is, is there anybody in the audience that I can 
dangle a bit of a carrot with you today and uh, ask you to come and join me up on stage. So I thought I'd bring some chocolate with me because I think that's probably more important than the actual book itself. But I've got a copy of my book and I've got some lovely Toblerone chocolate here. So would anybody like to come and join me up on stage just so that we can um, have some fun with what we've been talking about so far? Anybody here would like to come and join me up on stage? What's that, sorry? Yeah, it's your birthday, so do you want to come and join me up on stage? Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so all I'm going to say is, um, please pick up your mobile phones and get ready to create a video. Because the question that I asked Sophia was actually a question that goes back to where I started my professional career. And that was as a professional hip hop dancer. That's how I started. Look at his face. <laughs> That's how I started my life, getting paid 250 pounds to come and dance on stage. I danced with brands like The Prodigy, and I was on different TV shows, and I had a lot of fun when I was younger. So the one question that I asked Sophia the robot was, can robots dance? Obviously, a very important question. And she looked around, she thought about it, and she said, no, robots can't dance. So today, what we're going to do is show robots how humans can do the robot. Now, I'm going to show, sorry, what's your name? Bill. Bill. I'm going to show Bill not only how to do the robot, but actually walk on the moon. <laughs> so, and this is all about the energy of the room today. And we are actually, let's just do this. Can everybody just turn around and give everybody a wave on who's doing the live stream at the moment? Just turn around. Hello, everybody. Wave your hands to everybody. Right, everybody, you're going to watch Bill on stage do the moonwalk in front of you and then finish up doing the robot. But I will only do it if the energy in the room is electric. So, do you want to see Bill do the moonwalk? Come on. <laughs> Obviously, a really important question when you're speaking to robots, what to ask them. So, Bill, um, what I'd like to do, please, is stand and face the curtain. Sta uh, no, not quite. Uh, no, you can't walk off just yet. I'll come and stand next to me here and turn around and face the curtain. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a quick growth hack. This is what we do in technology of how to do the moonwalk. So we'll do the moonwalk together, and when we finish, I want you to turn around, and I want to give everybody the robot. Is that all right? Excellent. Good, good, good. So one more time. Do you want to see Bill do the robot? <laughs> OK, so I'm going to give you a quick short tip. Um, with your right foot, lift it up in the air on, on, the, um, on your toes, and then what I want you to do is, as you push your right foot back down, lift your left foot up onto its toes. So I'm going to try it again. So with the right foot up, left foot down, right foot up, left foot down. It's pretty good. You've got a little technique going on. OK, so we'll come back here. Right, ready? We're going to do the robot, and we're going to do the moonwalk and finish up doing the robot. You up for this, birthday boy? OK. Get your cameras out, videos. Here goes Bill on his birthday doing the moonwalk in front of 100 people and hundreds online. OK, you ready? We'll start with our right foot up in the air. And let's go. Go. Very good, and turn around, let's do the robot for everybody. <laughs> Give a round of applause, everybody, please. Bill. Please, Bill, come and get your birthday present, which is a book and some chocolate. Some chocolate. Thank, thank, thank you, you very much for thank being you, sir. No problem at all. So global change is here. And asking the right questions at the right time is key. But not only that, what I want to try and do now is to, is to Create, create a bit of a common language, a language when we're talking about how we do what we do from a leadership perspective and connect those dots to technology. I want to create this common language in the room for you because um, you know, there's been lots of conversations around technology and what it is, but I want to put it into stages for you. you know, there's this overused word around digital transformation and what it means. So I'll create this common language with you today so that after today, you can start going asking the right questions. Digitization. 
Again, there are words that are being used all around online that might be slightly misleading. So I'm going to clarify them today for you. Digitization is just taking something that we used to do in the past, in other words, pushing pieces of paper around, doing something on an Excel spreadsheet, and creating an automated version of it. Now, there are tools out there with, you know, just some of the work that we do with PwC is taking very complex Excel spreadsheets, putting it into a piece of technology like Altrex, creating a workflow, and automating something that would take normally 1,500 hours of somebody's time in a matter of minutes. We are creating a better version of the past by automating what we're doing. So this is digitization. Just taking what we used to do and creating an automated version of it. Now, here comes the complex part. This is called digitalization. And there are three stages to digitalization. And this is all about this world. You think about that, my son's a cyborg, the blurred lines between what's happening inside of our minds compared to what's going on in a piece of technology. It all starts with where we used to be. Physically, we used to go and meet our clients, come to meetings, used to put events on and have conversations. It got fast-tracked with what happened with COVID. Everybody went online, started to engage with us, try and find us, have conversations with us. So this is where we're looking at actually going a digital version of what we used to do. And this is where it gets really sexy, when the technology that we're using is just invisible. Nobody knows how many, I'm going to try and not get too technical here, how many different pieces of information are coming into this particular platform. It's irrelevant. It just works in a way that we don't even know what's going on. Um, I was over in Dubai last week and uh, doing a presentation to a board uh, of a financial company. And one of the board members said, yeah, I couldn't believe it. I was driving my car and I got really tired. And I said to my son, do you want to take over driving the car? And then he went, oh, yeah, you're not insured. He went, don't worry, Dad. There you go. I'm insured for the next hour. That should get us home. Invisible. A certificate to say you can drive my car for an hour. All happened within a matter of minutes. So this is where we go through this journey that we're on, digital transformation. It isn't just a better version of the past. It's the next stage of how we take that technology and create it in a way so it's invisible. There's no latency. In other words, there's no gap between when you sign into something and when you finally get into it. There's no latency there. It's just smooth. All the right information is in there for you and your clients to do what they need to do. So I'm going to break this um, digitization and digitalization into two core parts for you today. The first part is the internal customer. In other words, your stakeholders, your members of staff, what happens here at HLB, some of your partners that you've got, the collaborators that you've got, those people that are connected to your company but actually don't bring any revenue in. So I like to call them your internal customers. Now, the World Economic Forum every year looks at what's happening globally around the world and says, what's missing? What do people need more of right now to help them succeed in the future? And there were three core elements, the ones that I really love from the World Economic Forum. The very first one is complex problem solving. If we know that we have a problem over here, and we know that we want to create this invisible technology journey, how do we get from there to there? Complex problem solving. Being creative. I know you've heard this word quite a lot over the last two days. Taking the time out to be creative. And the last one, being, working together with other people, collaborations. As I said, you were very productive during lockdown. Now, let's try and ignite that creativity and work out ways of collaborating. So we're going to have another little bit of fun now. And it's not just going to include Bill. It's going to include everybody. 
I really want to help you make a point in the room today in just a matter of minutes. So for those of you that are online at the moment, I want you to go through the exact same process. If there's a couple of you in the room, do what I'm going to share with everybody in the room. If you're on your own, just write it down. Literally just write it down and think about it for yourself. So what we're going to do now is play what I like to call the compass game. And we're going to put some clarity on what this compass looks like. Now, I came into this room earlier, and around the room, there are some stickies on the wall, uh, post-it notes that I've put onto the wall. And I would like, in a minute, everybody to get up and go to a designated place according to what's written on the wall. I really want to make a point with you today and help you get a, a better understanding of how we communicate. So does any of this sound familiar to you? She needs every piece of detail before we get started, and it really slows us down. Or he acts before we agree on what's really going on and starts to make a lot of mistakes. You ever heard these statements before and resonate with you? OK, so this is what we're going to do. I'm going to ask everybody to get up in the room. And what I want you to do is I'm going to put four positioning statements on the wall and it's going to be north, east, south, and west. And depending on your, your personality, your, your own personal style, I want you to go to the different points in the room. And I'm going to tell you where those points are. Four different points in the room with four different personalities, four different ways of working. So these are the four different positioning statements. So just for a moment, and for those of you that are online, think about which one of these you are. Do you just want to get it done, and you just act on impulse? Or do you really like to kind of speculate and look more at the big picture? Do you want to take your time and look at everything that's going on? Do you really care about others? And actually, it's that caring part of you that people really love, and you empathize with everybody. Or are you somebody that is all about the detail? Every single thing that you do has to be about the, the, the small, minute detail. So these are the four different positioning statements. This will all come to light in a moment, I promise you. So this is what I'd like you to do, please. Now you've thought about one of these, this is what I'd like you to do. If north, so whoever is acting and they really like to get things done, if you'd like to stand up, please, and come over here. So this is where north's going to be. If you'd like to just get off your seats for a minute and come and stand over here, please. This is where I'd like north to be. Got a lot of doers in the room. <laughs> You'd be surprised. We've got a lot of doers in the room. Nothing that I wasn't expecting. Yeah, over there. Um, if you are in the East, so you're all about the big picture. You like to speculate around what's going on. Um, what I'd like you to do, please, is come to this little space that's just here. So there's a little yellow post-it note that says E on it just there. Um, so if you'd like to just stand here, please. If you're all about the big picture, and uh, you really like to kind of speculate around what's going on, please come and stand there. Uh, if you are in the south, please go to the corner at the back over there. So if you are very uh, caring and empathetic and you're really interested in how people are feeling, please go to that corner over there if you're in the south. In the south, over in that far corner over there, so where the projector is. And last but not least, if you really love the detail and you're west, please go in this little nook that we've got over here. So please come over here. It could be a mix of That's, yeah, it, it, it's, it, it does happen. Okay, uh, west is here, yep. South is over there in the corner. So just, just take a little look around here. Take a little look around, tell everybody online, remember, write it down. If you're in a room, go to the different corners of the room. OK, great. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you some questions. And within your group, I want you to have a conversation. 
And I want you within your group to answer one of these questions around what we're going to be doing. So we've got two small groups and two very big groups. So there's probably going to be heightened noise going here, and that's OK. Now, with our style and with all the different types of technology that's out there at the moment, it can be very confusing. Confusing in the way that we receive information, but also based on our styles, the way that we would communicate using technology. So I'm going to break this down into two very simple ways. Do you use short form communication or long form communication? So think about your style. This isn't just about you communicating with your team. It's also the way that you communicate with your customers. So I've got some questions for you. I want you to discuss them in your groups. This is the very first one. How do you like to communicate? So in your groups, how do you like to communicate? Do you like to communicate in short form? So you just like to send a thumbs up, and that means, yep, I agree to everything. <laughs> or do you, when somebody says, well, are we going to be doing that tomorrow? Yeah, we're going to be doing that. And don't forget, we're gonna, I'll, I'll make a booking for the restaurant. And then, well, well, actually, we'll book by the window with what's going on. Um, shall, I, shall I book Ed and make sure they've got that same wine that we had when we had that before? And so they're writing a whole chapter and verse to you when actually all you wanted was a thumbs up. So within your groups, please have a discussion. How do you like to communicate? So in other words, how do you like to talk to other people? Is it short form, an emoji, or just a sentence? Or is it more of a long form communication where you want to put all the detail in? Discuss in your groups, please, which one it is. If you're doing this online, you can write this down. OK, so if I could just have your attention, please. Um, you should have now had a chance to have a conversation with the people in your group. And you should have found some similarities in regards to the way that you like to communicate. So now what I want to do, I'm going to deepen this for you. If you're over here and we like to act fast, they might have liked to communicate in a certain way. In other words, it might be short form or long form. So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to add another layer of complexity into this. Now, this particular form of communication is done through technology. So now what I want you to do, now you've decided on whether it's short form or long form the way that you like to communicate, I want you to ask yourself the questions around how, what type of technology do you use to communicate that message? What's your preferred medium? Now, the funny thing is, I ended up listening to a couple of conversations that were going on around breakfast this morning. And I'm really intrigued because there was one person that was saying, please communicate me this way. And so I'm going to be really intrigued to hear whether or not everybody in the room likes to communicate this way, as that person said. So what I'd like to do now, please, is if it's short form, how do you like, what, what tool do you use to communicate that? You'd use WhatsApp, if you've got Slack, if you've got an internal chat bot that you use. Or if it's long form, is it on email? Do you like to put a whole Word document together, save it as a PDF, and send it along? So in your groups, please decide what technology you use with your communication style.
For those of you that are online, just write it down. Write down the technology that you like to use. If you're online, write it down. Finished already. I like it. Okay, so if I could have your attention, please. So I'm just going to go back a couple of slides to remind us all of the different um, uh, uh, groups that we had here. So I'm going to come over to this group first because they finished first. So we're, we're West, right? Over here. So we are paying attention to the detail. So if you could just share with me, please, the way that you like to communicate, is it normally short form or long form? OK, and what sort of, go on. Oh, so you, you like to use short form and email communication. So when you're paying attention to the detail, you just want to get that information across quickly and succinctly. OK, very good. Uh, I'm going to come over here to this big group over here. So to the guys that like to act fast and think quick, what, what's your preferred medium? How, how do you like to communicate, short form or long form? Short form. And so what type of tool do you like to use to get that information across quickly? What, what's that? OK, Teams, WhatsApp. So in other words, a, a, a chat environment where you can get the answer quickly and move on to doing what you were doing. Thank you very much. Um, what, what did we agree here? Because we've got a big group here. What, what did we agree? Are we short form, long form? Short form. What, what tools do you like to use? What's that? So you, you, again, short form communication, get the answer that I need and to be able to move on. OK, great. And to, 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 the, to the guys that we love over in the corner, the, the, em, the, the empathy people, the, we've got the huggers in the corner. So uh, to, to, <laughs> talk to me. What, 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 did the, what, what did the huggers say? What do you like, short form, long form? <laughs> do you like short form, long form? What, what do you prefer when you're communicating? OK, OK. Depends on the audience. Ah, interesting. <laughs> Did you hear that? The empathy guys care about everybody else. You lot don't care about anybody else. <laughs> anyway, so it's who you're communicating to that you then potentially choose the way of you communicate and the tool of which you communicate. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, don't we love the empathy guys? <laughs> <laughs> So I, I'm, I'm going to now answer the question for what I heard earlier. Um, somebody over breakfast, and he'll, he'll probably know who he is um, when I say this, said, OK, great, you know, we've got all this going on. Email me. Send me an email. And yet you, OK, yeah, I just want WhatsApp. You, short form, yeah, you quite like you know, email communication, and you just were happy to just receive the information that was being shared earlier. <laughs> so my point here is that we do what we do. And let me come through this. Uh, um, we do what we do, and we, based on our personalities and the way that we like to communicate, would choose that preferred medium and communicate what we want to that person, apart from the empathy guys over there. Because communication is actually never about you. Well, I'm going to say good communication is never about you. So the next time you want to communicate something to somebody else, have that curiosity to understand how it will be received. Empathize with that person to be able to understand how they're going to receive it. Have the courage maybe just to do something a little bit different. And make sure from a positioning perspective, you get all the information that you need based on that person's reality, that person's map of the world. So thank you very much. Please go and grab your seats. Thank you.
So now we've had a chance to think about the, what I like to call the internal customer. Those stakeholders, those members of staff, the people that are working remotely, um, the people that we're doing collaborations with, the technology company, um, you know, whoever it might be, those individuals that help us run our business. Think about how we communicate and choose the right type of technology that connects with them. Because good communication is never about you. So now what we're going to do is talk about the external customer. That individual that actually helps us do what we do. They're the ones that we're here for, we serve, we connect with, we have conversations with, and we help. It's those individuals that pay us for our knowledge. Now, a couple of quick questions for you. As of today, right now, this morning, when I actually change this, um, how many websites do you think are live online right now? How many websites are on the World Wide Web right now? How many do you think? If you're online, write it down, see if you get it right. How many do you think? Shout out number. How many? Bit billions, a little bit more specific. <laughs> We're in a data-driven world. Two billion? Awesome, correct. Actually, well, it's about one... Clicker's not working. There you go. 1.98 billion. <laughs> one point. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> Bill, will you share a piece of chocolate with him later? <laughs> Uh, how, many think, how many people do you think are online engaging with these nearly two billion websites? How many people are, who said five? Were you online this morning with me as well? No. Um, it's actually increased. So it is 5.03 billion. Um, as of a couple of weeks ago, it was 4.98. So it's increasing at a rate of around about 500,000 per month. It's incredible the rate at which people are now going online because of, as was mentioned earlier, the type of technology that we can now use. Um, I've worked over in Kenya, and Kenya is a 100% cashless society. Everybody's using technology to be able to send, make, receive payments. Everything is happening online. Now, I looked at this data. I wrote my book back in 2014. I rewrote it again in 2017. And during lockdown, um, when all of my business ceased to exist, I looked at all this data again. And I analyzed it, and I read, and I listened, and I looked at what was going on. And as of today, on average, there are 11.4 touch points before somebody actually engages with you with your services, 11.4 touch points. Now that started off around about 7.2, it increased about 9.6, and now it's at 11.4. So if you think about this word that we've been talking about earlier and, and the, the compass game that we played, communication, 11.4 touch points. Every single one of those leads the user to the next journey along to the point at which they then finally decide that yep you're the firm that they want to work with now any one of those touch points if there is a broken page on the website if there is a linkedin profile that's not been updated where, where, where's chip where's chip in the room where is he hey chip i love your style true digital leadership a real LinkedIn influencer over there. We've been engaging for weeks, right? Thank you very much for that. 11.4 touch points, great tool like LinkedIn, can very quickly reduce all of that for you. They can see a comment that you made or a post that you made, and then they'll click on your profile, and there'll be other conversations that you had. They're deepening their understanding of who they are. You're using this digital tool to help make sense of all the noise that's going on around at the moment and give your positioning, you're empathizing, you're getting people to be curious about you, and you've got the courage to be able to start communicating onto these platforms. Now, we've gone through phases, Web 1.0, where it was just about an archive, it was actually called Archie, then we've moved into Web 2.0, where we've really been able to use technology in a way that helps us 
push out our marketing message. We use tools like LinkedIn. We use things like Google to be able to talk about what we're doing. We go to events where we pull up a stand and we talk to people. We push onto other people what it is that we do. And these tools and this technology allows us to do that. And that might well be the first step of the journey. You might have great search engine optimization for your website. Somebody goes online and they type in some keywords and your website appears. Great, touch point number one. They come over to your website and then what we want to do is we want to pull them into your business. Does anybody know what championship this is? This is a real championship. This is the, in Alaska, they actually teach this at school. It's the ear pulling championship. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, I, I found the pitch and I thought it was quite funny. And I was doing some work with 3M and the guy went, they taught me how to do that at school. And it was over in America. And he went, I was born in Alaska. And at school, they actually teach you how to do ear pulling because it is a real championship over there. But let's go back to the technology to be able to automate a communication. Someone comes onto your website and they give you their details. You don't wait for those details to be pushed to you and then maybe communicate back to them in the next 24 hours. We use technology that then allows us to drip feed the value of what we do to that particular prospect. Because once they've become part of your database, you've got their email address and potentially their name, they're a prospect of yours. And using marketing automation allows you to, again, shorten that 11.4 touch point life cycle. So the technology is out there. And it's become, uh, uh, just out of curiosity, how many people are using marketing automation at the moment? How many of you using it for your business? OK, this is a great opportunity for you. There are so many tools that are out there, and they don't have to be industry specific, and they actually don't cost a lot of money. But you can go onto websites to be able to find. I, use, I have a whole team of virtual assistants that help me that are specialists in marketing automation or paid advertising. You just pay them for the work that they do. Because things are shifting. Tim Berners-Lee, the founder of the World Wide Web, we're moving into Web3, which is more of a decentralized web. I work in countries like Malaysia, where cryptocurrency and blockchain, no problem at all. I'm flying to Saudi Arabia tomorrow, where it's a massive no. We don't do anything to do with blockchain, and we don't do cryptocurrencies. So this global shift that's happening around the world is changing what we're doing. And so what I'm going to give you now is all the years that I've been doing this over the last 15 years, I've been looking at all the core, core components around what can we be doing on a daily basis to be able to help us achieve our outcome. We've heard 2030, 2040, 2050. So I'm going to give you these building blocks. To do that, we've got to reinvent. We've got to think slightly differently. And it's a word that's probably been used a couple of times over the last couple of days. And that is all about having a data-driven business model. It was mentioned earlier in regards to the way that we're working. Um, uh, just uh, who's here from the UK? Who, who just put your hand if you're from the UK? Um, if you're on uh, Facebook at all, have you seen any adverts from Volvo coming up? Because Volvo have completely reinvented the way that they work. They are now a subscription-based platform. You can subscribe to have a $100,000 um, XC90 on your driveway in five days. If you don't like it after three months, you just cancel your subscription, and they come and collect the car, and you can take it back. We're not talking leasing. We're not talking um, buying. We're talking subscribing to a physical product. Why? Because it's all about the data. If they can get data of how somebody's driving, and again, they use blockchain technology, where the cobalt's mined over in Congo, where then that goes into the particular battery, then how that goes into the car, and then how that's then put on somebody's driveway, all sits in blockchain. It all sits in an environment that's immutable. It cannot be broken. So where it came from and who owns it, this, you've got this digital ledger that just allows you to see this. 
So reinventing the business model. And these are the six pillars that I want to share with you now. Um, strategically, how are we going to achieve our outcomes? Using the right technology to achieve those outcomes. Making sure that we're looking at the data with what's going on. Making sure that we've got enough time to innovate, to be curious, to create around what's going on. Engaging, making sure that we're having those two-way conversations that add value. And the very last one is all about the skills. Upskilling ourselves, upskilling the understanding of what the future looks like. If we know that, you know, I, I genuinely believe this, that my girls will get married in the metaverse. They're three and five, and I genuinely believe they will get married in the meta metaverse. Will my, will my wife make them have a physical wedding? 100%. Will they go into the metaverse with all their mates and get married again? Yes, they will. And there's nothing that we can do about this, the rate at which this is happening. However, if you take any one of these away, we get challenges within what we're doing. So if we take the data-driven strategy away, all we're doing is creating a better version of the past. In other words, we're digitizing, going from analog to digital. If we remove the technology, we get frustrated. I heard the conversation happening earlier. There's two big players in the market at the moment. There's challenges with that, and we're bringing out another piece of technology you know, with what's going on. You haven't got the right tech to do the right job. We get frustrated. If asked a different question, how many people here have tried marketing automation and then gave up on it, I might have a different amount of hands going in the air because you get frustrated. If we don't look at the data, we just flatline. I'm not going to ask this question, but in your heads, when was the last time you looked at how many people came to your website? And how many of those people were new visitors and existing visitors? Where did they come from? What's the demographic? What's the age? What's their location? You've got all of that data there to be able to do something with it. If we don't look at that, we just get stagnation. If we take the, um, where are we? If we take the uh, innovation and the process out of the equation, I think from a culture shift perspective, if we connect the process to the people, that's when we change really happens. A new way of thinking and doing. Because if we take that out of the way, we get incoherent actions. Um, we get resistance. If we've not got you know, the right team on board, we've got, and we're not talking to our customers, we create something that we think is of value to the customer, we get that resistance. And if we haven't got the right skills, we get anxiety. We genuinely go home going, I don't know what to do. I don't know. I feel, I feel the way that I feel because it's just challenging me all the time. So to be able to upskill. So I think if we have all of these core building blocks, this is when we can transform what we do every single day. This is taking the digital out of the equation and just transforming, going on a journey. So I think we need to have a bit of a mindset shift, and I'm cautious of time. The traditional way of thinking. How can I make more money from my customers? What is it that I've got that I know that they want? And it's shifting that mindset and the empathy lot over there going, oh, no, don't talk about that. But let's shift our mindsets to be more customer-centric and really try and understand what's important to them. What type of relationship do they need to build with me? With the knowledge that I've got, the skills that I've got, the network that I have globally around the world, I've got a lot of value to bring. So does that mean that the customer's in the driving seat? If we're going to be customer-centric and we're going to be understanding what's important to the customer and empathizing with them, is it that the customer's in the driving seat? Well, I think not. I think this traditional way of um, we're doing business to our customers or we're doing business to business to our customers, I think we need to shift that, and that comes from a data-driven perspective. And I think we need to do it for them. What type of business can we create for our customers? What type of relationships can we create with partners that we can do business for business for the customer? And that creates a great amount of value and data moving forward. So I think, actually, it's a collaboration. We're co-pilots in regards to what we're doing, understanding what's important to them and understanding the value that we bring. So we are in this digital journey. And we need this key to unlock that potential around what's going on. 
Now, I've mentioned this a couple of times today, and I'm just going to finish up with just sharing with you this concept. And it's a concept which is called sense making. I've touched on it a few times today with what's going on. And it's ultimately about you with the knowledge that you've got and what's going on around you, helping your customers in a way based on the relationship that they want to build with you. And it isn't about what you can give them. And it's not about what you can tell them. It's all about making sense of the noise that's happening out there at the moment. We did the compass game earlier. You're probably working with some very you know, um, fast growing startup businesses or very traditional organizations. Each one of those has a different purpose, a different understanding of the value that you bring. So let's make sense of all the noise that's going on out there and communicate in a way that really connects with our customers. So the last thing that I want to leave you with today is you've had two days of awesome speakers and a lot of great information. I'm going to ask you this question. What are you going to go and act on? So what actually are you going to go and take action on? From what you've heard, what are you going to go and take and apply? Is there something that you're going to go and change? Maybe it's looking at the marketing automation. I don't know. But this is the one that I love the most. What is it that you can go and transfer to be able to help make sense of the noise that's out there that builds relationships and builds rapport with your customers from an internal customer perspective and an external customer? So ignite your creativity of innovation and be that true digital leader. Thank you very much. Warren, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today. No problem. So hopefully you'll all lead with, uh, with digital, be great digital leaders in our space. Thank you so much, Warren. No all right, next up, we're going to waste no time. Marina, where are you, Marina? You're going to introduce our last session of the day. Oh, there you are. Come on up. Come on. All right, you got a little transition going on here. You are. You're impressed by the digital world? So, all right, you're going to be a good digital leader here. I'll help you up the stairs. Come on. <laughs> all right, there you go. There you go. OK, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're still with us, uh, because we have arrived at the 